Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayekadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. You know, many of you have written me and told me how you are reading and studying your Bibles as you never have before. And for that, I am truly grateful. More importantly, the Lord is grateful. Because aside of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Word of God is the greatest gift that we have been given. And we should spend as much time as we possibly can in reading and studying the Word of God. For that is where the victory lies. Well, today is February the 24th in the year of our Lord, 2018, and this is One a Day for the Soul. Now, we're continuing our journey through the story of the Bible, and today we come to an interesting story, and we're going to pick up in Joshua chapter 2 and verse 1. Now, just as Moses sent out spies to spy the land, and Joshua happened to be one of those spies... Now Joshua is going to send out spies to spy out Jericho because the people of Israel are making their way into the land of Canaan, which is known as the promised land. But it is occupied right now with the descendants from Canaan or Ham, one of Noah's sons. If you'll remember in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 18, we're told the story of Ham who saw his father's nakedness and did something defiling to him. And because of this, he was cursed. And in verse 15 of chapter 10, it says Canaan or Ham, who was cursed. And we know that from chapter 9, verse 25. It says, unto him was born Sidon and Heth. And from this line came the Jebusite, the Amorite, the Gergesite, the Hivite, the Archite, the Sinite, the Arvadite, the Zimmerite, the Hamathite. And these were the families of the Canaanites that were spread abroad. So they now occupy the land of Canaan, named after Ham, and the children of Israel must go in and take the land for themselves. And that's what we're going to see Joshua begin to do. So back to Joshua chapter 2, verse 1. It says, Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out to Shittim two men to spy secretly. And he said unto them, Go view the land, even Jericho. And so they went. They came into a harlot's house named Rahab, and they lodged there. Now, this is very important because in Matthew, in chapter 1, we see the lineage of Jesus, the bloodline that led to Jesus being born. And in verse 5, it says, Salmon begat Booz of Rechab. Now, that's how the King James Version puts it. But it's actually Salmon begat Boaz of Rahab. And Boaz begat Obed of Ruth. And Obed begat Jesse. And Jesse, of course, was the father of King David. But what we see here is that Rahab, this harlot, this Gentile harlot is the great, 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 how many ever greats there are, grandmother of the Lord Jesus himself. And so back to Joshua chapter 2, it says, The spies came to Rahab the harlot's house, and it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in hither from the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, those that entered into thy house, for they have come to search out all our country. Now you would think Rahab would want to be patriotic to the country in which she lives, in which she belongs, but instead she honors God, yet she does it through a lie. Because verse 4 tells us, the woman took the two men, she hid them, and she said unto the king, these men did come unto me, but I do not know where they are. Now that is a blatant lie. And although God works past this lie and protects his spies, his people, 
it would be very interesting to see what God would have done if Rahab would have been honest, forthright, and upcoming rather than think she has to act on God's behalf and tell a lie in order to save these spies. It would be just like if you and I were going to try to smuggle Bibles into Russia, let's say, or into China. And at the border, they ask us if we have any Bibles on us. Well, we could say no, because the Bibles aren't actually on us. They're in our luggage. But what if they were to ask us a blatant question such as, are you bringing any Bibles into the country? Well, then we are only left to a yes or no response, one being honest and one being a blatant lie. And knowing that if we were to answer yes, we could be imprisoned, we seek to protect ourselves and to ensure the delivery of the Bibles to those that are waiting for them, so we tell a blatant lie. God never finds honor in a lie, friend. It doesn't matter how good the outcome may appear to be because of the lie. In other words, two wrongs don't make a right. Now, this doesn't mean that we have to approach the the guard and volunteer information, but when asked a question, our response should always be one of honesty. But in in our story, we see that Rahab lied. Well, it came to pass in verse 5, about the time of the shutting of the gate, when it was dark, that the men left. Now, this is Rahab continuing her her lie to the king. So she says they left, and, and I do not know where they went. But if you go after them quickly, you should be able to overtake them. But instead, she had brought them up to the roof of her house, hid them within the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order upon the roof. So they were hiding under the flax. Well, the king's men pursued after them all the way to Jordan unto the fords. And as soon as they had pursued after them, they shut the gate. Now, the city of Jericho is tightly shut because they are aware that the children of Israel are approaching. They've heard the stories of the conquering people of the children of Israel. And so no one at this time is being allowed to go out or to come in. And the city has great fortified walls. And so it would appear that the children of Israel are not going to be able to enter into the city and conquer the city. Well, when the men, the king's men, were gone out of the city pursuing supposedly these two spies that had fled the city all along being on the roof of Rahab's house, Before they had laid down, she came up to them on the roof. And she said unto these men, I know that the Lord, the Almighty, Yahweh, Rahab recognizes this. She doesn't use the term God as a little God or a Lord. She says, I know that the Almighty has given you the land and your terror is fallen upon us. We've heard about you. And we are in great fear because we fear that you're going to attack us. And everyone in the land is faint because of you. We know how the Most High has dried up the water out of the Red Sea for you, allowing you to escape Egypt. We know what you did unto the two kings of the Amorites, how you utterly destroyed them. And as soon as we heard these tales, our hearts melted within us. For the Lord your God... He is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Therefore, I pray you, I ask of you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you will also show kindness unto my father's house and give me a true token, that you will save alive my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, and deliver our lives from death when you attack the city. And the men answered her, our life for yours. If you will not tell of our business here, it shall be when the Lord has given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with thee. So based upon them having given her their word, she let them down by a cord through the window. And she said unto them, go to the mountain, lest the pursuers meet you. Hide yourself for three days. And then once the pursuers have returned, then you can go your way. And the men said unto her, We will be blameless of this thine oath, which you have made us swear. 
Behold, when we return and we come into the land, you will bind a line of scarlet thread in the window. And when we see this thread, we will protect this home. And all who are within this home will be saved alive. But if you leave the home, you will be killed along with everyone else in the city. And their blood will not be upon our hands, but will be upon their own hands because they have broken what we have commanded you to do. And so Rahab says in verse 21, according unto your words, so be it. And she sent them away. And as they departed, she bound the scarlet line in the window. <laughs> she wasn't wasting any time. Well, in verse 24, the men return unto Joshua and they report back all that they have learned. And they say, the Lord has delivered into our hands all the land, for even all the inhabitants of the country do faint because of us. Yes, but how are they going to break through these fortified walls? Well, it seems as if they have not even considered that. They're simply reporting back that the people are in fear, and because they are in fear, this is a weakness for them, and so they can defeat the people. And while that is true, they must get to the people because the people are on the other side of the fortified walls. And this is where we're going to see Yahweh, the Almighty, intervene and fight for his people. Well, now God is still establishing Joshua's role as a leader to the people. And so he wants to parallel the life of Moses as much as he can. And in chapter 3, verse 7, the Lord says unto Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify you in the sight of Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And so God commands them to take the Ark of the Covenant, separate the priests who are going to carry the Ark of the Covenant from the people by a distance of roughly half a mile. They are going to cross the Jordan, and when the priest's feet hit the water, the water is going to split in two, just as the Red Sea did for Moses. And then the people can cross, just like Moses, on dry ground. And obviously the people are going to equate this miracle with that that Moses did. And therefore that is going to exalt Joshua as a great leader among them, equal to that of Moses. Well, that's where chapter four picks up. And it says, it came to pass when all the people were clean passed over Jordan, that the Lord spake unto Joshua saying, take 12 men out of the people, one out of every tribe and command them to take 12 stones out of the Jordan, carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you shall lodge this night. Now, remember again, the people are on their way to the promised land. So in chapter three, verse 10, Joshua said unto the people, hereby you will know that the living God is among you and that he without fail will drive out from before you the Canaanites. We talked about this a few moments ago. These are the descendants of Ham, the cursed one. And from this bloodline come the Hittites, the Hivites, the Parasites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. And these are the people that will be conquered. Well, back to verse 5, Joshua says to these 12 men, one taken from each tribe of Israel, pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan and take you up every man a stone upon his shoulder. And this will be a sign among you that when your children in the future ask their fathers in time to come, saying, what meaneth these stones, this monument that has been built? You will say unto them that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it passed over the Jordan. Therefore, these stones, this monument, will be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. And in verse 8, it says the children of Israel did as Joshua commanded. And in verse 13, it says there were about 40,000 that were prepared for war in the plains of Jericho. And on that day, the Lord magnified Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they feared Joshua as they feared Moses. They revered Joshua. They respected Joshua. And they did that from this moment until the day that Joshua died. 
Well, now that the people are entering into Canaan, into the promised land, and they're coming out of their wilderness experience, they find much food and vegetation within the land. And so in chapter 5, verse 11, it says, They did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover. Unleavened cakes, parched corn in the selfsame day. And the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land. Neither had the children of Israel manna any more, but they ate of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. So the time of punishment for Israel, based upon their disobedience in the past, is now over, and they are entering into a new time, into a new land. And God isn't going to provide for them any more manna. Now they're going to be expected to feed themselves produce crops, and enjoy what the land has to offer them. Well, it came to pass, or after some time, when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and he looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto the man and said unto him, Are you for us, or are you against us? And the man said, Nay, But as captain of the host of the Lord have I come. And Joshua immediately fell upon his face to the earth, and he worshiped and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Now any time in the Bible that a man fell before an angel, an angel was always quick to pick that man up and say, don't worship me, you worship the Lord God Almighty. But notice that this captain of the Lord's army doesn't say that. And so it would appear to me that the captain of the Lord's army is the Lord Jesus himself. And notice he tells Joshua the same thing that Moses was told. Take thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place wherein thou stand is holy. And Joshua did so. So the Lord is preparing Joshua to go in and take the city of Jericho. And this is such a personal experience with Joshua, for Joshua on his behalf, that all of his faith, all of his trust is in the Lord. And we already know that Joshua was a great believer in God, Because even though the other 10 spies had given a bad report and said, we need to wait to go into the land, it was Joshua and Caleb that said, no, let's go take the land now. We've got God on our side. But I think we can understand that how this even fortifies even more Joshua's belief and trust in the Almighty because he has now had a personal encounter with the Almighty just like Moses himself had. Well, we're going to close there today, friends. And before we close, let us be reminded of how all this began with a harlot, a woman named Rahab, who acted on God's behalf to ensure the protection of the people of God and their forthcoming victory over the city of Jericho. And that's what we'll talk about the next time we're together. But when we see that God used a a harlot, a prostitute, and even more than that, a Gentile in his great plan. It should only remind us of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 27 when it says, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and base things of the world and things which are despised. These are the things that God has chosen. Why? Because of verse 25. It is the foolishness of God that is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. And I want to point that out because I know sometimes we feel like a very small cog in a very large wheel. Sometimes we do feel foolish. Sometimes we do feel weak. Sometimes we do feel powerless, but when we abide in the Lord Jesus Christ, as we have been commanded to do, God can use us for his glory and do great things through us. And so let us look not to our own strength 
our own wisdom, our own power, our own might, but let us stand in the Lord in all things and at all times, knowing that he is the captain of the army of God. And if he goes before us, praise God, nothing can be against us. Well, friends, I am so thankful that you are again with us, sitting under the learning of the word of God. I am so thankful to the Lord Jesus that you have this hunger in your heart. And I want to encourage you today to give God praise for that hunger. Because I can't help but notice when I visit many of the sites on YouTube, just as you do probably, there are literally tens of thousands of views and tens of thousands of subscribers to websites and to videos that mean nothing in our day-to-day walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. But there are few. It is very rare you will find someone who is desperate for the Lord Jesus, the truth of the Lord Jesus, and the truth of his holy word. And so I, in this moment, on behalf of the Lord Jesus, want to say thank you for devoting the time and the effort into learning his word so that you can become a better follower, a more faithful follower in his kingdom and for his purpose. As a loving father, he is proud of you for the strides that you are making and the way that you are growing because of the effort that you are putting in. And so let your focus be upon how you have grown so far in reading and studying his word and let that motivate you and fill you with great anticipation as to where the Lord wants to take you. Amen. Hallelujah, friends. Well, may the Lord Jesus bless your day today. May your heart be full of praise and your soul full of joy. Now, as he wills and until next time, friends, I truly love you. I'll see you on the next video.